Welcome back to Active Self Protection Extra. Today I'm with Andrew Henry from Henry Holsters, who's Hello. part of the Holster Consortium. So I want to talk today about what makes for a good holster, some features you might look for in a good holster. In a previous video, we talked about the difference of a kind of a, a custom Kydex uh, bender and why these holsters might cost a few bucks more. Now I want to talk about what makes for a good holster. And I think that you might be surprised at some of the important details. Today's active self-protection lesson is made possible thanks to the generosity of sponsors like LuckyGunner.com. Please check out Lucky Gunner for all your ammunition needs. Big thing here, three things that a holster has to do, right? So it, it's required for it to be acceptable. Holster has to hold the firearm securely, has to allow access to the firearm reliably, has to cover the trigger guard completely. Those three things are required in order to uh, just be considered a holster. I say acceptable. it's okay. Uh, and there are plenty of holsters that are mediocre that do that, and that's okay. If you carry in one that's acceptable, it's acceptable. That's great. It's like, you know, uh, driving a, a car that works. Like, yeah. Okay, Brakes fine. Brakes work. Yeah. Gas pedal works. Steering wheel works. You'll get there. You'll get there. It's good. You a seatbelt. All right. So now I want to ask you, what do, we, what do you think, what are the first thing you look for in what you, what you would look for in a good holster? So anytime I pick up a holster and handle it, there are a few things as a maker I look at that tell me whether or not the process that was used to build the holster is going to deliver a consistent result that performs well. And some of those things are visible cosmetically in terms of understanding what kind of mold was used and how consistently the plastic is formed. But as a user, and I carry all the time, um, what I'm looking for is unobstructed access to the firearm, secure retention. So when I put a firearm in, I feel it's really in there. I'm not like wobbling around or rocking around or feeling that it's loose. And then I want to make sure that when I put it on my belt, I know that it's all the way on there. I don't like any attachments that, you know, sometimes they're all the way on and I move around and later in the course of the day, I find that my belt loop has, you know, belt clip has worked loose. Yeah. If I find that ever, that is like a flashing red warning sign. That's like danger, danger. This needs to be addressed because you won't catch that every time it happens. And if it happens and then you really need the gun and you pull the whole gun and the holster out, you have a whole new set of problems to solve that you've probably never trained for. Well, and I, I have, I mean, we taught, I think, about 310 students on the line in 2019. And I can think of three different instances when we had a student draw a holstered gun. And, and that, that whole holstering gun comes out and all of a sudden they go, oh, what? I mean... Huh? And, and it's amazing watching them do that. That's a bad juju. So I see most clips and yep. I say, I don't like regular holster clips. Yep. So I look for stuff like soft loops. I, I love soft loops on a holster. For a long time, soft loops have been the gold standard. There are several other attachment options that I have no reservations about recommending. Primary being discrete carry concepts, steel overhook clips. And they have a variety of styles and sizes. Mm -hmm. Basically, everything they make is solid. I recommend them without reservation. They're good. Um, I use them on some of my personal holsters. We offer soft loops for two reasons. First, because they're adjustable to belt size, so we don't have to know off the, off the bat exactly what your belt width is to provide you a soft loop that you can easily resize with just a screwdriver. You just move the post from hole to hole until the loop is yep. snug on your belt, and there are flexible materials. So the clip, a clip can suddenly catastrophically fail. Plastic, if you flex it enough times, will develop stress cracks and will eventually just fail catastrophically. This biothane material is rated for about 750 pounds and it's flexible. Um, you're not going to rip the soft loop. I really like them. They're what I've used for a long, long, long time. Um, most plastic overhooks either are flexible enough that they don't really bite onto the bottom of your belt or they're just not... They never really get on there in the first place. Yeah. A lot of them are just kind of a, a generalized shape that fits over the belt and closes over the bottom. But if you actually, you know, put a blue gun in one of those holsters and go roll around <laughs> on the mat at jiu-jitsu, you're going to find that that thing comes loose in astonishing ways because the human body is a kind of a soft shape and dynamic movement and everything. It's not the same as standing on the range. And, and if you go watch the main videos on the main channel, you see people and you go, well, I'm not going to get into a fight like that. I'm not going to do that. Well, it's true. I mean, there's not a lot of entangled gunfights on the channel, but people do move in crazy ways, and then they got to go get the gun in a compromised position. I do love soft loops. I'm a soft loop fan. And these are also called pull-the-dot loops. You'll hear those called pull-the-dot all the time. The reason, if you're not familiar with these loops, they, they have to be pulled from the top in order to come out. If you pull them from the top, then it'll pop out because it's got this little, uh, little flat spot in it. But when it's connected and, and it's tight, what will happen is, is that if you try to pull it from the other side, it can't. And so it, literally when you're putting pressure on it upward from the belt, from the belt, 
it literally cannot open. It's not physically possible. Physics prevents it. So that means that this, when you clip that shut, it's, it is permanently attached to your belt until you, you know, pull the belt out the side or you pull the dots from the top. Aside from a fully closed loop where you have to thread the belt through yep. it, soft loops are probably the most secure attachment option that's widely available. You've got to have some kind of of cam device that'll pull that grip, the, the grip of the gun towards you. You yep. have to. If you don't, you're going to have this big thing sticking out the side of you. You've got to have something <clears throat> to push the muzzle of the gun out. I am a little bit um, fluffy. I have some tactical enhancements uh, throughout my middle. Uh, and so I like having even, you know, a, a base pad like this that pushes that a little bit further out. And, and some people really do. <clears throat> some holster makers will actually mold the wedge in yep. as we do on our Henry holsters, but you can also add foam or gel pads or anything else you want over that to increase cushioning or increase the amount of angle it produces. Uh, Tom's holsters are smooth back, but you can throw some loop Velcro on there and then stick any one of the several different versions of a foam wedge that Darkstar offers. And then you can tune the position, I love the, the angle, comfort the wedge. height. Yeah. The comfort wedge is life. There are a lot of different ways to do that, and you can adjust to taste, which is really nice. So appendix carry is even more than strong side carry. It's very personal and based on body type. It's based on where you, where you wear your pants, the height of your hips, the belt you wear. Um, it's kind of counter to conventional wisdom. It always used to be thought that for a gun belt, stiffer is better. In appendix carry, actually, we want it to be moderately flexible because the gun and the holster have to move with you a little bit more as you bend and crouch and run around doing high knees. Yeah, yeah. You need a little more yeah. flexibility at the belt and that can actually improve your comfort and consumer, which is a little counterintuitive. Vertical rigidity and torsional flexibility in that belt I find is really important for a yeah. pedics carry. Big time important. As a skinny guy, when I first got, you know, an <clears throat> ultra stiff, you know, multi-layer range oriented holster and tried a pedics carry with that, first of all, it looked like a hula hoop because it wouldn't conform to my body in the front or the back where I was flattened. So it actually, the belt buckle poked out through my shirt. But after a while, it just hurt me. Yeah, and you just can't deal with it. So I really think finding something, guys, if, if you're looking to appendix carry especially, and if I find a holster, I, in fact, I, I'm going to be really kind here and, and circumspect, but <clears throat> I had a company, because I get this all the time, John, we'd love you to some feedback for our, our appendix holster. I don't really think you want to do that, but if you want to waste your money and send me a holster, go ahead. And they did, and they said, oh, here's our appendix holster, and it's new, and it's cool. And I'm like, it doesn't have any kind of a wing system for cam. It doesn't have any kind of a wedging system. It's a strong side holster that you say put on your appendix. And, and instead, I really think you got to look at, at fitting an appendix holster. Uh, you know, I, I know John from Filster talks about this more like fitting a, a prosthesis than about yeah. buying a piece of gear. And, and <clears> really, like, holsters always used to just be gun shaped because they were generally molded around a gun. But it's not necessarily the case that the outside of the holster has to be the shape of a gun. And so as we have more control over the mold we're using in the, in the forming process, we can build more ergonomic features directly into the shell so that the overall holster is blended and rounded and smoothed in critical areas so you don't have to spend time trimming it away or adding mole skin or taping or gluing foam on. So there's a lot of options there. But the joke used to be like, what's the difference between a strong side and a Dependix holster? I don't know, 10 degrees, 15 bucks, something like that. Right. Like yeah. That was the only difference was we just made it a straight drop holster, we call it Appendix, and we charge more for it. <laughs> it's 2020. That's not state of the art. It's just not the case. So I think this is a good, a good beginning for you guys to look. And if you have a, you know, when you're starting to think about this, and, and more and more people are Appendix carrying, and I guarantee you somebody's going to say here, but Appendix carry isn't safe. That's a whole other discussion. It is safe. Uh, that's ridiculous to say otherwise, but but these are some things that you can look for. Can I adjust the ride height? Does it have a, a cam system as well as a wedging system available to me? Is it cut correctly? Um, I personally like a high sweat guard. Yep. But that sweat guard has to not uh, hinder access to the firearm, right? You yep. can't. I see sweat guards, especially on hybrid holsters that are these Very big large. monsters that keep me from being able to get my hand on the gun. That's not okay. But uh, having some kind of a sweat guard, I find, is incredibly important to keep the, the gun off of uh, your skin. So I think having some of those, and folks like uh, you, Andrew, Henry Holsters, you make quality stuff. And when you make quality stuff, then people can, can actually have some success doing this. Well, man. Yeah, and if you have some trepidation about the features and the kinds of holsters that are available, most modern small holster shops offer a really generous return policy. If you buy anything from my web store and you don't like it, send it back. I'll refund your money. The bad old days of you ordered a custom holster and you are stuck with it. You waited 16 weeks, it doesn't work for you at all, and thank you, I have your money, don't ever call me again. 
that's not the case mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah, that's true. So you can really afford to try something out and see if it works for you. And of course, you want to make sure that you email them first before you, or look at their policy on their website, because not everybody does that, but the good ones certainly do. Yeah. And you know, because they don't want you stuck with a bunch of crap. It's the internet age, right? It's you know, we're all a couple of bad Yelp reviews away from uh, you know uh, people not buying our stuff anymore. So, man, Andrew, tons of good information here, man, and I really appreciate you coming and dropping some knowledge on us. Thank you, John. Thank you.